share and communicate the Christian faith. I'm going to grab a chair because I'm going to be talking about um, three different postures this evening. Is that okay? <coughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, five years. Yes, you're quite so sure. I don't know what you're passionate about, and maybe some of you here are passionate about sport, or passionate about the arts, or passionate about travel. As a nine-year-old boy, the most passionate thing I was really passionate about was football stickers. You know what I mean? I said clip sticks as a kid, yeah? And then, uh, it was this massive thing when I was a child, and uh, Basically, you go and spend the rewards to go and buy a packet of stickers, and you then have to trade for an ounce of paper, and you say, God, 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 need that one, God, 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 and you kind of trade stickers. There's always one kid in the school who was, had super rich parents. <laughs> Within like two weeks, the sticking album was being out, he would have completed four albums already, and have a massive stack of like swaps. So he would do something like school called scrambles. But this still happens, I'm not sure anymore, but um, basically, you tell the kids, who right, at lunchtime, I'm going to do scrambles for my stickers. And they're all like, yeah, cool, stick, stick. And you kind of usher every child into one tiny corner of the playground behind one of the kind of, uh, kind of shed things. And then while the teachers are like, where have all the kids got? And like, a tiny corner. Then you do scrambles and the kids go crazy for stickers. And then you pull out the shiny stickers. <laughs> and now we're going to do scrambles for these. Further in the year, again, complete chaos. There'll be bits of uniform and teeth. <laughs> these kids jumping off all of these things. But it's funny, I think, as we get older, sometimes perhaps some of the ways we show our passions are not as obvious. And um, I guess over this weekend we're going to be exploring this idea of how do we share more of who Jesus is, what he's done in our life with those around us and in our community. And there might be some of us, I guess, who perhaps this evening are feeling perhaps our passion for God has waned slightly that perhaps we were more passionate about God many years ago and perhaps kind of gently just gone through life and become maybe less passionate about God. Or some of us perhaps here are really passionate about God and really fired up about sharing our faith. But when I open this first evening by just sharing some, some thoughts from Jonah, the book of Jonah, I think for me this book is about what it means to have a passion for God. And it reminds me again just of who God is and what he is about, and how he wants to work in and through our lives. So we're going to look at the whole book of the next eight hours, is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> Let's start in Jonah, in, in Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, Go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because its wickedness had come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound to that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to their own God. And they threw their cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone down below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us, that we will not perish. And the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, Tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kinds of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, What have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, What should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know it's my fault, but this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to try and go back to land, but they could not. The sea grew even wilder than before. And they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. And they took Jonah and threw him overboard. And a raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord. 
and they uh, offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Father God, as we um, unpacked in this ancient story from so many years ago, we pray that you speak directly into our context here in the 21st century. And God, we simply invite you by your spirit to stir nudge us, to challenge us, perhaps to restore us with that passion for you again that may have waned. Or perhaps if you are passionate about you today, may you help us again just to, to grasp again what it is to be passionate about the things that you are passionate about as well. So move through this talk in this space this evening we pray. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Some of you might know that Jonah was already a prophet. And the idea of a prophet isn't someone who just predicts the future, but somebody who really shares God's heart in a moment. And I guess we all get to do that on some level, sharing God's heart for a place or for a people. And if you read 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 23 to 7, 27, you'll find out that he had a good job. He was basically a, normally a prophet, a well-respected prophet, quite a comfortable lifestyle, and he was normally told to share the nice things to Israel. You guys are doing great. God's going to bless you. Things are going well. But suddenly in Jonah 1 verse 1, things shift and change, when he's given a very different commission. He's told to go to the great city of Nineveh and to preach against it. Some of you will know that uh, Nineveh was a notorious uh, city. About 60 miles of comfort, about 120,000 people. But he actually raced three chariots on top of the wall all around this great city. And they were known as being a people who were really unfriendly. Now, some people think that London is unfriendly, but this takes to a whole other level of unfriendliness. As part of the Assyrian Empire, they used to catch people and then try and flay them alive, taking away as much skin as possible before they actually die. I mean, pretty gruesome stuff. And they would uh, use hooks to kind of take prisoners of water and hook them through their, their faces. I mean, horrendous stuff. I won't go into too much detail. But don't, don't do weak images of Nineveh. It's not a nice picture. So he's told to go to this great city. He's also told to go with a certain message. And Israel has been saying, ah, God's blessing you and God is for you. But he's told now to go and preach against Nineveh. The idea here is that actually God is incensed by the sin of this city. I think it's really important to remember again that, that our God is just and, and holy. And that is something of who God is, of his character. I guess we can so easily try and, I guess, wipe that away, but for me it's really important that God gets angry at what is wrong in the world. That when there is things like human trafficking and people not having clean water and so much corruption, I think this really does break God's heart. This is part of who God is and who we are created to be as we represent Him here on earth, representing His heart for different things. God's got angry at the wickedness in the river, but He's also committed to their recovery. Jonah has his first idea, this chair, is that first thing of, of go to Nineveh. Now, that first sentence can be um, defined or, or, or worded as arise, get up. To arise and go to Nineveh. And my first kind of, I guess, physical expression is are we willing to arise and go to the people that God has for us to go to? Are we willing to go and share this message we have from God with the people in our communities? Are we willing to speak about the things that Jesus has done? We all have a calling upon our lives, and all of us have some specific things we're called to do, but there are some things as Christians that we all have that are, we are called to go and to make disciples. And uh, I've got a friend who's... Um, based in a church in America, he went to this, this one church, and he said, it's really strange, he got to the church, and as he entered the, the venue, they'd taken away all the chairs, they laid plastic sheeting on the floor, and then they got lots of garbage and tipped it into the middle of the church, okay, so they were kind of like rubbish and wrappers and bits of old food, a pile of rubbish, and everyone kind of walked into this worship space going, what have you done to our church? And I kind of stood around the edge, this is a really weird thing, what is happening here? And then the person leading the service actually waded into all this muck and dirt and everything else and pulled out a bottle of wine and some bread. And so we're actually going to have communion in the middle of this mess as a symbolic act that Christ came into the mess of human history. 
And as we share in this meal of bread and wine, we are symbolically wading into the mess and actually sharing this mystery of hope with the brokenness and the mess that we're in around us. The idea that actually we are called to go not in our comfortable place of sitting down, but we are called to rise and to go where God has called us to go. There's a word ruach, which means discomfort, which keeps appearing throughout the book of Jonah. God wants to comfort the disturbed, but to disturb the comfortable. Perhaps sometimes we have become so comfortable, we've missed something of the calling that God has in our lives to speak and to share his good news. In verse 2, in verse, in verse 3, Jonah immediately tried to run away. There's no conversation with God. There's no dialogue. There's no wrestling this decision through. Immediately, Jonah decides to leave. The cost is too high. It is called to go to near. He says no. This idea of the calling upon our lives, that sometimes we can actually say no and choose the comfortable rather than choose to be made uncomfortable and to go where God is calling us to go. He ends up fleeing away trying to get away from Yahweh. And you look on a map at where Nineveh was, it's kind of modern day Iran, Iraq. It went completely the opposite direction and over the sea. And interestingly, the sea, uh, the, the Jewish people, has a little bit, the sea was a place of chaos, and the God was the God of Israel. Almost, perhaps he was thinking by going away to the sea, I almost escape God completely. I think sometimes we begin to hide away from the calling we have to share more of who he is. We're trying to live a comfortable life rather than following the calling. We can actually end up hiding from God. Trying to get away from the presence of God because all that sense of conviction. Yet I believe that God has called each and every one of us to be involved in his redemptive plans here in the world around us. Jonah ends up running away from God's presence, perhaps trying to escape that sense of conviction. Wherever God calls us, wherever there are moments of God's God calls us to do things, there is always a Tarshish. There is always an easier, perhaps more comfortable idea. When perhaps we're called to share our faith and speak out in a certain moment, the comfortable thing can be to keep quiet. Whether it's something about saying something that is true and that is right, the easier thing can be just to go with the flow. Where perhaps have we settled for being too comfortable and not allowing God to really call us into the places where we're called to go, where perhaps we've sometimes gone for a Tarshish moment rather than going to Nineveh. When we undervalue the significance of God's calling in our lives, we undervalue God's passion for this world. When we undervalue the calling, we undervalue God's power to see things change. When we undervalue God's calling, we undervalue the part we can play in his great story. Jonah is found asleep in his boat. And he's asleep physically, but he's also maybe asleep spiritually. And there he's woken up by these sailors. I don't know if you've, if you've been on planes before, but you've got on an airplane. I don't know, anyone here a nervous flyer? <laughs> if you know class. Um, if you're on a plane and you get a bit worried, the thing to do is to look at those who are kind of serving you, the, the hostesses. If they're, they're calm, then everything's going to be okay. When they panic, you know it's time for you to panic, yeah? <laughs> In this story, it's the sailors who are panicking. The sailors are freaking out, and actually they, they think they, they tip their cargo, all their riches, overboard. They're that scared. And there's something, they actually, there's something spiritual. They're trying to work out, well, what is the God element here? What is going on in this place? They, they, they eventually wake him up. And they bombard him with these questions. And what I love about this whole concept is that Jonah has almost tried to run away and he ends up in the sea, thinking he's got away from God. And the word for wind that blows on the water that creates the storm is the word ruach that we have in Genesis. Because it also can mean the spirit, the wind of God. They actually he's tried to run away from God, but even God is still here, as is in this scenario. And they wake him up with these barrage of questions. And he's reminded again just of who he is. And he realizes that it's his fault, and he gets thrown into the sea. The first posture of this chair is the idea of being willing to stand up, to arise, to go where God's going to go. How in the last week have we perhaps 
been living too comfortably? Are there senses of conviction upon our lives and things that we should be perhaps doing or saying that perhaps you've chosen to live a comfortable life rather than living an obedient life? I find this first posture to stand and to go to arise, that first verse uh, of Jonah chapter 1. Where is God calling us to go? Who is God calling us to go to? As the story continues, we see this amazing prayer that he prays in the, in the belly of this big fish. And uh, this, this is the first time in the, in the book we actually see him begin to interact with God again. And this prayer is so profound. There's so much in there. Um, yeah. And eventually he's vomited onto the dry land. Again, another nice mental picture as Jonah vomited from a big fish onto the beach. Then he has to begin to retrace his, his, his footsteps. And in chapter 3 we have this. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And Nineveh was a very large city and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began, to, began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming <coughs> 20 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. As I guess Jonah is vomited on the beach, he begins to realise that he has this gift of life again. I know it's like to be in a belly for three days, but I guess it's not particularly ple uh, pleasant. And I guess for me, as I, as I read this again recently, I was challenged again of how much do I realise that life is such a gift? We can just take it for granted. Um, if I said to you, I'm going to give you a million pounds, you might think, great, great, brilliant, yeah, good stuff. I said, you're right, I'm give you a million pounds, but you're going to die in a week. You think, oh, no, that doesn't sound very good, too much, The gift of life is so much more precious than everything else, and yet often we just devalue what the gift of life is. I've got a friend that was texting just now who's, who's dying with cancer, and he's become so aware of the brevity of life. And Jonah, I guess, in this passage, as he's given a second chance, as he's recommissioned again, he understands that life is this precious gift. And he begins to work out what it's all about, as he begins to obediently follow what God has for him. Jonah 3, verse 3, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to the Lord. You know what, I don't think he's particularly excited. I don't think he was going, great, let's go to Nineveh. <laughs> I don't think he was really keen on the kind of commission he'd been given. I think he was probably still daunted by the whole task. But he goes because he's being obedient to God. I just imagine, I guess, turning up in this vast city, this big city, 120,000 people. He hasn't got an Uncle Jim who lives there. He knows no one there at all. This is his people's enemy. I guess he's been physically stained from being inside this big fish. Perhaps his, his hair will come off and he's kind of got skulls in his face from the burn from being the acid inside the tummy. Perhaps he's stunk of inner big fish intestine kind of smell, whatever that smells like. And he's going to this barbaric culture. I guess he was almost fearing for his life, but, but he, he gets this right perspective and he goes obediently to the superpower of his day to go and give them a message that he's not sure they particularly want to hear. Have you asked me the question, will I ever be respected? Will I ever be taken seriously? Won't people just laugh at me? I guess sometimes we're looking at how we share our faith, we always have those same sense of questions like, how can God use me? This could go horribly, God's going to be really embarrassed. As Marks will share tomorrow, evangelism can be fun. <laughs> Actually, God can work through it. And it's about being obedient, I think, and seeing these opportunities. Now, the idea of the second chance, we all get second chances, make mistakes, we get second and third and fourth chance, we are recommissioned into the plans that God has for us. Jonah, the name Jonah means dove. And the idea, I guess, of, of, of peace and almost the idea of the Holy Spirit, which is heard about us now. And son of Amatai means son of truth. Some of you guys wanted to film Spartacus you know, at the end, and they all go, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus, I'm Spartacus. Well, I guess in a way we're all a bit like Jonah. Perhaps we're all a bit nervous about the whole thing, and yet we know that we are people of peace, peacemakers. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit, 
and we are sons and daughters of truth as we carry the truth of what Christ has done. That first action was about standing up, the call to go. The second is about kneeling down, expecting God to move. So what I find incredible is the response that takes place in the We've got no idea exactly how Jonah did it. Did he begin you know, by just preaching somewhere? Did he begin in a one-on-one -on -one conversation? We're not quite sure. But something significant happens as he goes into the city. I'll pick up the story in 3 verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. They didn't believe Jonah, but they believed God. A fast was proclaimed. And all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. I've got him. Um, do you ever get a new t-shirt and you get like a label inside? It really rubs. You think, oh, it's really annoying. Imagine covering yourself in sackcloth. That must really kind of rub and scratch and be uncomfortable. But they all do it. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself in sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, God may yet even relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The Ninevites believe God. And I love to say that belief isn't just something we believe in our heads, but it, it, it comes out in what we do. And there are kind of three symbolic things that take place. There is the fast. They, they stop eating. The, the power of that the fast. They put this sackcloth, and then they cover themselves in ash. I have to say, what's amazing about the fast is it isn't just the people, but they make the animals do it as well. You know, we have got cats and dogs. Can you imagine, car, you know, hello, Buffles, here's some sackcloth for you. <laughs> and there's been no, no food for you today because we're on a fox. Is that okay? It's, it's a bizarre concept. I think it's the only time in history it's mentioned that I did that animals fasting. But they took what was happening so seriously that actually God moved them. There were these three practical things. The decree was issued. Second of all, they called urgently on God. And third of all, they gave up their evil ways and their violence. There was transformation in that city. This is a picture of what happens when God moves. What would it look like if God moved in this way in Teddington? Can you begin to imagine what could happen? But well, then sometimes we don't have that sense of expectancy, believing that God could do it in our time. But I believe that he can. This, this message that he begins to share goes viral when it reaches the kingdom. The whole area is transformed and changed. When we begin gossiping the gospel, you've got no idea where it's going to end up. From the greatest to the least, anyone can end up hearing that gospel message as you begin to share it. Even these barbaric people were transformed and changed. And I believe that God can do it again. Verse, uh, verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. The word compassion is not just about empathy, but it's, almost, it's coupled with action. God shows compassion to Jonah as he disobeys the call. God shows compassion to Nineveh, this evil city. And this is a reminder again that God shows each and every one of us his compassion as well. God will move heaven and earth to offer his love to people. And he's done that for us and will do it for people in our community as well. So the first call is the call to stand, the, to arise and to go. The second posture is actually kneeling down. Now that king who's running an empire is so moved by God that he takes up his royal robes, covers himself in sackcloth, gets in the ash, and it's a real picture of humility. I think I want to remind you again that often we can look back at church life and see how things have gradually dwindled over the years. But that hasn't got to be the future story. Mm -hmm. I believe that God can and wants to do something significant in your church, in amongst your community. 
But it does take this posture. The first posture to get up and to go. The second posture to actually kneel down and to pray. That as these Ninevites pray, God moves powerfully. How are you as a people, how are we as people going to pray and expect God to move? You can take it seriously. They put on sackcloth. I think we should put on sackcloth tomorrow. But <laughs> they took it seriously. They even began to fast. And things changed completely. I'll just jump into the third bit to finish off. So the first posture, this one here, to get up and to go, to arise to go, to call on the of our lives, to share our faith. The second posture is kneeling down in humility, praying with expectancy that God could move in our places, in our locations, that God who did stuff in history is still doing stuff here today. And that third posture is this one here. About standing up on your chair. Okay. Don't everyone do it for the safety, but it's, uh, it's there. Because this happens. God moves powerfully. Good work. Good for it, I said. It's that like God moves powerfully, God transforms things. But Jonah's, Jonah's kind of sat down in his chair, and he's kind of waiting to watch the end of a bird. So I don't know what you're like in the cinema. Me and my wife always argue about where we should sit. Do you ever do this at all with your people you go to cinema with? No? Okay, so, I always go in and my wife just goes to the loo, so I go and find a seat. And I'll sit down for the movie and then she'll come in and go, Do we have to sit here? And I'm like, uh, I guess not. You have to move somewhere else to find a different seat. In the... But Jonas found this perfect seat. He's there ready to watch the Nineveh burn, and then God doesn't do it. And there's a picture of God's grace because God cares about these people. And Jonah gets really upset by this, and this, this big plant grows up and it covers him in this big leaf. In chapter four, and uh, the, the, the kind of the leaf kind of protects him from the sun. He's enjoying it. This is a good bit of protection for me. And this worm comes, and the, the whole kind of thing dies, and the leaf goes away. It's a pretty random story in chapter four. Often we miss out, and he gets really cross. Like God, how could you do this? How did this happen? This year, oh, he gets really angry with God. And they say that actually in that part of the world story, even today, that when the east wind is blowing, it's such a, a hot horrible place to be, that if you do a crime, you get a lesser punishment because it's so intense, the heat. And so it is a pretty horrible thing, but Jonah becomes obsessed with this plant, and he's not obsessed with the people. And God is going to really challenge him, saying, Jonah, you've got the wrong thing here, you've got the wrong picture. I care about these people. He says the word concerned, used in the scripture there, is the word almost of tears in the eyes of God as he looks upon these people in Nineveh who don't know their right from their left. And that third posture is really about seeing things differently, seeing things from a different perspective. And Jonah in this story, he's so focused on how he sees things, on his perspective, on his being comfortable, on what, how he's going to be treated, that he misses out of seeing the bigger picture. And I guess even this week, I've had a couple of chances to share the gospel with him. When it was last night, I was, uh, I was with my wife, we had a first date night in ages, and, uh, and we went for a meal, and we went past the pub for a drink the way home, and uh, quite a quiet pub, sat there having my drink, and this guy comes over, and uh, he's wearing sunglasses, and he's a bit, a bit drunk, comes sit next to us, and we're like, and he begins to tell his life story. And we're like, oh, we're having they not here, really? <laughs> and he begins to share, but he wasn't, he wasn't a nice guy. Um, IRA links, EDL, drug trafficker, uh, done some really horrible stuff. And uh, I began saying to him, you know, can we pray for you? And he wasn't keen on prayer, but interesting that the place of society he knows about is, is the church. He goes to church building, he feels peace. But apart from that, he's got no peace in his life. Really open competition with this guy. And he like, no, 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 don't pray for me. Are you trying to convert me? He's like, we're having a good day. You came over and interrupted us. It's been five years. <laughs> but actually, there is a part of me which says, I don't want to be around this guy. He's not a nice person. He's a, he's a horrible person. He does some horrible things. And yet, I've got to allow God to bring my heart for him. I've got to see that different perspective. It wasn't just seeing how I see things. Actually, what is it that God wants to speak into his life? What is it that God wants for him in his future? How can I perhaps be a witness to Jesus in this moment? The idea that seeing from a different point of view. I think sometimes we are so like Jonah, we're so caught up, and we, we like God to see how things, how we see things, 
rather we are allowing God to break our heart for the things that break his heart. And so I guess the third challenge, the first challenge from here is to arise and go. It's to arise and go. Where is God calling us to go and share more of who he is? Who are the people that God's put in your heart you're already praying for? What will you take those opportunities and not just say in a safe place? Will you take those opportunities not to try and find a Tarshish, but go where God's calling you to go? The second thing is, will we really begin to pray with expectancy that actually God can do something in the most horrendous of situations? If you can do it in Nineveh, and you can do it with a guy in the pub who won't take off his sunglasses because he's scared we can see into him, God can do it anywhere. Will we on our knees pray expectantly that God will move? And then the third thing is, will we see things from a different point of view? Will we say, God, help me not to view situations and view people as I view them, but help me really to see how you see these people and how you see what's happening here. Give me your perspective, give me your point of view. These three postures, we do them not because we have to do them, but because of what God has done for us. I love it that in Jonah we see so many failings, but we, we also see something of how great Jesus is. That as, as Jonah was in a boat sleeping and, and he wakes up and, and he's full of fear of the storm, Jesus is woken up and he says, peace, be still on the lake. And time and time again, we see oh, Jonah, when he's told to go to, to Nineveh, and he goes, no, 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 I don't go to Nineveh. Jesus willingly goes to Jerusalem, knowing what lies ahead. And we see these bits of symmetry in their stories. But it's because of what Christ has done for us, that we respond by saying, how can I live out my life for you? How can I, first of all, stand up and go to the people and the places you've called me to go? How can I really pray Fervently, that you would move in our place. And thirdly, how would I help to see the world differently and see people as you see them? Just to be quiet for a moment right now. God, we, uh, yeah, we thank you for, first of all, your passion for us. That you are so passionate about us that you send your son Jesus. Help us just to realise that, that, you, that you love us. That you like us. That you desire that we would know more of who you are. I mean, again, just thank you for Jesus coming into the rubbish and the mess and the brokenness and giving his life. And this weekend we really long to have our passion reignited. Our folks are already passionate. Help us to give us some practical things we can do next. <coughs> and I ask you right now this evening, just that by your spirit, you would help us just to respond to those three images. Perhaps for some of us we've been sat down comfortably, rather than really going where you call us to go. <coughs> May you stir our hearts, we would arise and go to the people and the places you've called us to go. Perhaps for some of us, we've given up hope that things can change. We think, oh, that person, they'll never come to faith. Or this situation can never be transformed. Or this could never happen in Teddington. But would you give us that sense of expectancy that as we are on our knees, pray before you that you can do more than we can ask or imagine. And Father God, as we are in our community, talk to different people, and we work colleagues or neighbours, help us not be so blinkered by our own perspective, but help us to see that different people. Help us not to be like Jonah, more concerned about our comfort and our plant coverings and our shade, but help us to really sense the value you see in other people. And help us to speak of your truth and your grace and your love to each of them. <clears throat> perhaps now, since we, um, we respond to God perhaps this weekend, maybe somebody to physically stand up and say, God, I'm willing to go. I'm willing to go. Wherever you're calling me to go, wherever you're calling me to go to, I'm willing to go. Maybe somebody to kneel on the floor for a minute.
and say, God, give me that sense of expectancy again, that as I pray, things would happen. Help me to become an intercessor for Teddington. And perhaps for some of us, we need to almost, we will practically stand up on our chairs and say, God, help me see things differently. Help me see things how you see things. Break my heart for what breaks yours. So next minute, if you want to take a posture, you can do it, no pressure. If not, I'm going to do it, but if you want to, take a posture. And I'll pray.